una experiencia en Razorfish, una gran agencia interactiva, con su experiencia en Pepsi, un gran anunciante, donde es el responsable de todo lo digital. Uh, y lleva 10 años trabajando en los temas de community management. Nada más, Shiv, thank you for being with us. Can you all hear me? Yes. Um, so I'm not sure whether he called me a turtle or something, but it would have been the first time ever. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is the future of uh, uh, social marketing. You know, we, we, we talk about how digital is changing, how media companies are dying, how uh, things happen all of a sudden, how the fundamentals of storytelling still exist, that e-commerce is transforming. I'm going to try and just frame it for you through the lens of social and through the red lens of our brand marketer uh, from that point of view. And uh, along the way, I think uh, we'll have some fun. So I always like to start with this quote. Uh, this is from Peter Drucker, probably one of the greatest management thinkers uh, of the last century. And he said, the purpose of a business is to create a customer. You know, it's, it's such a beautiful quote. It captures everything about why we're in business and what, we're, what we try to do every day. Now, you know, the interesting thing with him is, uh, uh, two things. Well, firstly, tragically, you know, he passed away a few years ago, just before this whole social media boom really took off. Um, and, and it's a pity because a lot of the philosophies that he embodied are brought to life through what we're seeing in social media today. Um, but I would also like to suggest something else, which is if Peter Drucker were alive today, and if he were watching everything that was going on in social media, he would change this quote and instead he would say, the purpose of a business is to create a customer who creates customers. When you think about everything that's happening in digital, everything that's happening in the social media space, when you think about you know, how we are all transforming our marketing efforts, uh, certainly the way I make sense of it all is through this lens that it allows us to create customers who then go and do the work for us. Um, but it's harder than we realize because it means we have to take care of those existing customers a lot more and wherever they are, on their terms, on location with them and as a more social brand. So I just wanted to start with that thought, something for you to keep at the back of your mind as I walk uh, through this presentation. Um, the way I thought I'd frame this up is five ideas. Five ideas that I worry about and think about and five things uh, that I feel will make a difference and transform uh, the future of not just social marketing, but digital marketing as a whole. So the first one is all about creating a whole franchise, a whole new brand, in a sense, out of a social media initiative. So before I get into this, um, I'd like to ask everyone if you could just raise your hands and tell me, how many of you are familiar with the Pepsi Refresh project? So a few of you. Wonderful. Otherwise, I'd have run through it and said, oh gosh, that's one section that I don't need to spend time on uh, or shouldn't. So the Pepsi Refresh project is something that we started in February this year. It was a transformative new way of marketing. It was a social media effort, uh, which in fact uh, a few weeks ago was recognized by Forbes magazine as being one of the top five social media campaigns ever. Um, and what it is at its heart is, it's about empowering people who have great ideas to make a difference in their community. Because we think every one of us can have a great idea that can change the world and this whole marketing effort is about that. There are a couple of key pieces to it. So what did it start as in February? Firstly, it was all about giving marketing dollars to causes. Now, the word marketing is very important here because this is not corporate philanthropy dollars. This is dollars that would normally have gone for TV campaigns, print campaigns, radio, even digital campaigns. But here we're giving a lot of money away to causes, to people with good ideas that can change the world in a small way, or in a big way. It's social media at its heart. It allows any consumer to write an application of why they deserve the money, 
the application appears on uh, refresheverything.com and then people vote on it. The ideas for the most votes, they get the funding, they have 32 levels of grants and that's how it comes to life. So it's consumer driven, consumer decision making at its heart. Um, what it does in its, in its heart of it, which is very interesting is, if I submit an idea, I obviously want my idea to win, guess what I end up doing? I get all my friends and all my former girlfriends and all the girlfriends I don't even want my wife to know about to go to refresheverything.com and vote for my idea. Because if it gets the maximum votes, it gets the money. What makes that interesting from a Pepsi standpoint is that consumer who's getting his friends and his girlfriends to vote for his idea is telling them to go to the Pepsi website. And that friend by that very definition is building and extending the, the brand of, of Pepsi. There are multiple levels of awards each month and it's actually having a meaningful real impact on communities. It's, it's making a difference. It, it, it makes us uh, very excited. The way the program is, it's a year-long commitment over 12 months. It's not just a little campaign. Um, and this is sort of what it looks like. So every month we give away $1.3 million this way. That's 20 million US dollars over the course of the year, all through this website. And this is how it started. So this is not a small initiative for us by any means. This was a massive, massive uh, marketing effort centered in digital with social at its heart. Um, this is what the website looks like. So let me get fancy with this. There you can see. So, you know, that's the funding available each month, days left to vote, when we're announcing the finalists, ideas in the running, there are different categories and you can vote for ideas. It's a very simple, intuitive user experience. Now there are a couple of key things to share. One is we've had 120,000 ideas submitted. This is massive, a massive scale. And it's, it's, it's incredibly uh, amazing to see these ideas that people have. We have 4.1 million registered users. Well, now it's closer to five. We have 50 million, well, it's, uh, 55 million uh, as of this week. Uh, 55 million votes in total. Uh, by the end of this year, this site would have gotten more votes than President Obama did in the last election. It's, it's growing really big. And through it, we funded 400 ideas. So this is a social media campaign at its heart through this website very much, um, and it's making a difference in communities. Now, there are a couple of reasons why this matters. One is consumers are doing the marketing for us, as I alluded to earlier. The second thing, which is very interesting, is this website gets something like four or five million unique visitors a month. Now, the bizarre thing about this, and it blows my mind each time, is that this website gets more traffic than some of those media properties on which I buy advertising. When that starts to happen, you really start to wonder about how are you using your advertising dollars? And that's the kind of questions that we're grappling with. This is not a small initiative. It's, 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 we're, we're having to think about ourselves as media publishers, uh, as media companies. So, when we talk about media companies dying, I wouldn't say that they're dying by any means. I, I embrace media, I, I watch a lot of TV, I go to uh, several big uh, newspaper websites every day. But what I feel is happening is the media companies have competition of a totally different kind from sites like these, and certainly for the advertiser dollars. So something else that we've done along the way with this, one is we've included what we call shopper extensions. So at the risk of boring you about my business, so we sell beverages, as you can imagine, um, and we don't sell them online, um, we, we, uh, and we have no plans to do anytime soon, um, we, we sell through our retail partners, our supermarkets, our grocery stores, you know, you know through restaurants, wherever you expect to be able to buy Pepsi or Mountain Dew or Sierra Mist. Um, so those supermarkets are actually our customers because we sell to them and they sell to the consumers. We took this program, which was just a national program, 
and then customize it for our different customers. So like a very big supermarket chain in the States, as, uh, and you may know of them here, Safeway and Vons. So we had a mini version of Refresh Everything just for Safeway and its customers that they could run in a local market. So that's how the basic program was extended to our customers. Something else that we did was we wanted to give it a lot of energy and enthusiasm and, and sort of bring forward that, you know, uh, that challenger brand values around Pepsi and, and be a part of pop culture, which is very much in our brand. So we added a couple of extensions. We did things with some key celebrities and then also in sports. So here's another sort of uh, question, and I, I expect very few, if any, hands to go up for this one. How many of you follow baseball? Raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Just what I thought. <laughs> um, but I'm still going to explain it. I'm not going to teach you about baseball today. I'll spare you that. Um, but anyway, this is a, a baseball going on, t a game going on, and it's the Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees. They hate each other. Um, the interesting thing is, we went to these two teams and said, they're going to give $100,000 away to one of your two charities. The way we're going to give it away is, you've got to ask your fans to vote for you. Whichever team gets the most votes through the Refresh Everything website, that team will get the $100,000 for its charity. So all of a sudden, this was deeply integrated into US-centric pop culture through sports that way. And what we had then was uh, all these very famous US uh, uh, baseball players from these teams telling their fans whenever they had a chance, go to refresh everything, go for our idea because we have to beat the Boston Red Sox. So this idea which was giving $1.3 million away each month had these very social, very pop culture, sports driven extensions. Then we did something else as well. Um, and this was just the summer. So a certain oil company whose name I will not mention uh, caused all kinds of damage in the Gulf of Mexico this uh, last summer, as, as you may uh, uh, remember. Um, what we discovered very quickly and learned very quickly was that the local communities, people who border the Gulf of Mexico, were, were really suffering a lot through this because you know, their, 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 their whole living was being affected. So we ran a special program called Vote for the Gulf, asking Americans across America for ideas on, you know, what are the best ideas to help those local communities that are suffering. And it was a separate program, part of the Refresh Everything project, though, uh, with voting and the best ideas got the funding. So here again, that core concept about Refresh Everything was given even greater topical relevance. Um, and the New York Times called us out as being uh, one of the first two companies to be there for, for those people uh, in the Gulf who, who were hurting. Um, the campaign has been uh, incredibly successful, and it's, it's more of a program than a campaign. And we're actually now going, uh, uh, doing it again in 2011, and it's also going global. And this is just a sense of the amount of attention that it's been getting. Um, so what are the key implications of this? One, um, and this is the dark side of, of all of this stuff, it requires educating for what I call a perpetual beta world. So this is a massive website. Um, it takes a lot to manage. Um, it's risky. We know that you know, once in a while even Amazon or Google go down. Uh, we're giving $1.3 million away through this website we have to make sure it doesn't crash frequently. But it, it has once or twice. But that's just the way technology is. So it requires educating in our own marketing organization that we live in this world uh, of, that's, that's beta oriented. Unlike a can, which is, you know, once it hits the store shelves, we're guaranteed it's not going to crash or anything. But with the web, it's different. The second thing is it forces us as marketers not to just think as marketers or CMOs, but as what I refer to as CMTOs, Chief Marketing and Technology Officers. I tell my CMO that um, she needs to know the way people behave online and the way digital works 
uh, for us to be at the forefront of marketing. It's a new skill, it's a new area for her too. Thirdly, it's turning the economics of advertising upside down. I'm starting to wonder about paid advertising efforts online on media sites versus how much I attention I put here, given how successful it is. <laughs> Fourthly, it's resulting in a more continuous and consumer relationship. Um, it's, uh, what it's also doing is leveraging those social platforms strategically, not just tactically. And so, to summarize around this uh, first idea, it's all about this not being a campaign, but a commitment. Now, you know, that's becoming a cliche to say that. Um, you know, I'm sure if you Google that phrase, you'll get, you know, 10 million results back. The key thing, though, which I think we sometimes may forget is, a commitment is like a marriage, you know, and, you've got, and it can get boring very quickly, and you've got to keep doing new things to infuse energy and excitement into it. And that's something that we were very focused on. So that's the Pepsi Refresh Everything. One idea that's now extended into a franchise. It's nearly becoming a brand unto itself, all driven through social media. The second idea I want to discuss about is the reinvention of display media. All those wonderful banner ads that we uh, have a perpetual love-hate relationship with. So, these stats really scare me. These are US-centric stats. I hope they look better here in Europe for, for you and in Spain. But in the US, as marketers, we're in trouble. You know, 76% of people think we lie in our ads. 77% uh, trust us less than they did last year. 38% um, of people believe companies will do what is right. And only 15% enjoy the ads as much as programs. This, to me, means we have a crisis in marketing, quite simply. There's no, uh, uh, there's no other way to say it, but there's a crisis. If we go one step further, there's, there's a strange contradiction here. That's this number. This is $22 billion, the amount of money that is spent on online display advertising every year in the US. And, and in fact, I'll just read some projections for 2011. It's going to be $27 billion. It's going up. We're spending more and more on those display banners. But there's another piece to it, 0.4%. Can anyone guess what 0.4% is? It's the average click-through rate on those display banner ads. So it doesn't make sense to me. Consumers are trusting us less. We're spending more on online advertising. And no one's clicking on the ads. There's, there's something not working right here for me. And, and maybe I'm a bit too simple-minded, but it, it doesn't make sense. So I believe fundamentally that the whole display advertising business needs to evolve and it needs to change. And I'd like to humbly suggest one way it may and probably should. It's what I call the impression plus model. Um, so this is the model display advertising first started out with. It was a paid impression, and that was equal, equal value to the advertiser, which was the CPMs, you know, that was the metric. Then over time, it evolved to this, the paid impression, plus the click-through rate was billed as value to the advertiser. And arguably, that didn't do much better. And, and you know, then a lot of uh, media companies went back to just saying, we're going to sell you impressions. Seeing the ad is more than enough. Neither of these, in my uh, opinion, work for the future. I think we need to move to a model which I call the impression plus model, which looks something like this. You have your paid impression plus an organic impression, plus organic engagement, and that equals value to the advertiser. So what, that, what does that really mean? Imagine this scenario. I visit the New York Times website. I see an ad for a Ford Taurus, you know. That's the paid impression. There's something really engaging about that ad, and I share it, that message with a friend. That's the organic impression. When that friend then engages with that ad in some fashion, we get the organic engagement. And that together is what's valuable to Ford, or in my case, valuable to me. 
When I talk to media companies in the future and they want me to buy advertising on their websites, I'm going to be asking them more and more, don't just tell me about the paid impression, tell me what's the likelihood of there being organic impressions, organic engagement, and let's put a, a, a number around that because that's the value I'm looking for from you. And that's fundamentally what we are seeing here is the display advertising world meeting the social media world and linking together. Now, a few of you may feel that when we think about display advertising, it's, it, it doesn't work, it's yesterday, and I sort of hinted at that myself too. But there's one simple thing we, I think we, we must remember though about display advertising. The, the reach you get through display <coughs> advertising is unmatched. You can't get that through social media today. I mean, it's to the tunes of, you know, there are like different numbers of zeros at the end of the impressions or the engagement. But display advertising is only valuable if it's used to jumpstart social engagement. And as an advertiser, I want to know the value and I want to buy based on that whole ecosystem, not just on paid impression. Um, this is just an example of uh, our democracy program, something we did this summer uh, for our Mountain Dew brand. Basically, it was really interesting. We asked consumers across America to help us figure out what should be the next flavor of Mountain Dew or a special flavor of Mountain Dew. And we had these buses driving across country with tasting sessions. We were describing them online. Consumers could vote on them incredibly interesting and incredibly successful. But the most interesting piece of it all was we spent a small amount of money online to promote it through display advertising and then we got to the tune of eight times value through social engagement because that paid investment sparked a lot of deep engagement. So um, it was really a great example of the model. Something else we're doing that's blurring these uh, worlds together. Um, this is a study we, not a study, a, a test we ran with Facebook just uh, two weeks ago. First of its kind, uh, a few of you may have read about it in, uh, in some of the US trade publications like Adweek. Um, something that they had never done before, we had never done before, but it was based on the premise on big publisher websites, this is their TV site. Imagine if you have the banner ad but when you come to the page and you see the banner ad, you see two things. You see the Facebook like button and you see pictures of your friends automatically. Now, that's extremely interesting because what it's saying is, um, I like this Facebook, I like Mountain Dew, me as an individual, as a person, and so should you. If you're logged into Facebook from elsewhere on the web, it automatically recognizes that and puts in photographs of your friends. Where it gets even more interesting is that ad unit is not very expensive for me to push to uh, tens of millions of users overnight. You know, something which when you're doing something in social media alone, it's not always easy to reach that. We've been running this test, we're still waiting for the final numbers, but what we do know is just through this unique test alone, our like count or our fan count on Facebook has uh, uh, increased over the span of the weekend when it started running by 200,000. So incredibly exciting, incredibly interesting. Key to it is, you know, people need to like the brand at the end of the day and they need to care for uh, the creative as well. But it's another example of how we're bringing those worlds together. So some key implications of this. One, Display media still has its place. Don't fight it, but leverage it more strategically. The impression plus model can potentially be the future for display media. Three, it gives you leverage if you're a marketer talking to media companies online. Four, um, it results in looking at you know, your brand targets in different ways and reaching them more through your consumers like that uh, Facebook experiment as well. So that's the second idea, the evolution of display media by linking it with the world of social media. Third idea, time to turn brand marketing upside down. And each time I present this, 
I worry that I'll be heckled or kicked out of the room or something like that. I hope you'll be kind to me. I'm, I'm, I'm a visitor to your country. It's what I call by being done by building out social voices. So for a long time, marketing has been about strong brand voices. You know, your singular company voice, uh, it reflects the brand personality very well. Everybody follows it. It appears across all brand touch points. It's usually unique to the company, uh, not always. Um, it's sometimes manifested in the person, um, and it's used everywhere from signage to ads. That's what we know to be uh, uh, your brand voice. Every big brand has that. When you think of Amani in your head, you think of a very specific image. They make sure it's that one image that you think of whenever you think of Amani. Arguably, it's the same when you think of Pepsi or Mountain Dew or, or our products. However, I feel with the, with the explosion of social media, brand marketing is changing and having strong brand voices is not enough. You also need very strong social voices. Um, these are multiple authentic individual voices representing your brand. They are transparent and Googleable. How many of you think Googleable is a real world word? It actually, it's made up. Please don't look it up. Uh, please don't tell my mom. Um, it's fake. But the point is, when we interact with a brand online, we want to know that there's a real person behind it. We want to be able to take that name, put it into Google, and see sort of the fingerprints of that person in the digital ecosystem. Engaging and conversational, appear where the touch points are, unique to the person, not the company, and manifested in real people. That's what social voices are all about. And they need to be used only by real people. Now, we've all had spokespersons or spokespeople for companies. What I'm talking about here is multiple authentic real people, not just the celebrities, but people, many, many more people speaking on behalf of your brand. And, you know, so in the case of PepsiCo around the world, there's something like 300,000 people. Each person to their own social network can be the brand voice for Pepsi. And if they became the brand voice for Pepsi, you can bet our marketing would get a lot easier and a lot cheaper. And historically, we as marketers have felt that's wrong. You can't let anyone talk to consumers. With social media, it's happening regardless. It's worth allowing. A good company that's really exploring this and taking this further is Best Buy. This is how they used to market. You know, product-centric, discount-centric, price-oriented. They started experimenting with social media, starting with Barry Judge, their CMO, um, and they were a former client of mine, um, playing around, exploring the space. Then in the last two years, they decided to change it all completely. They developed what is called their 12th force, where they said every employee is a face of the brand, can be doing customer service for their brand. So what's so fascinating is on Twitter through 12th force, you can talk to their employees and get customer service, feedback, ideas. But not just that, when you walk into a Best Buy itself, you will see posters of these actual employees. So their brand is about real people all of a sudden. When you watch their TV ads, it's about their real employees talking about their products. And that's something that social media has done, is it's forced a certain kind of realness into marketing, and I think we're going to see more of that. Uh, what's right for PepsiCo brands is, you know, we're figuring that out. It varies, of course, uh, brand to brand and category to category. Um, so what other, well, this is a slow uh, build. As you can tell, I like slides that build. They're not neat, but they're fun. Um, so what are some of the key implications of this? One, people connect more with people online. And that's a fundamental shift in marketing for any digital effort, we have to recognize that. Secondly, brands need to become a lot more authentically social. I don't think we're there as yet. We still have a way to go. Thirdly, giving consumers the brand assets is a must. That's very important. Let them shape your brand with you. Let them be the advocates, the customers, creating the customers. And four, 
becoming a social brand is a journey. It can't just happen overnight. Oh, I just had a duplicate there. So the next idea, redefining the agency model. How many of you are from uh, uh, the agency world over here? Um, are there many of you? Some of you. Okay, you may either love this section or you may hate me. If you hate me, please don't tell me. Definitely don't tweet about it. Um, so fundamentally, at the heart of the way we work with agencies, the model on paper looks something like this. We have a brief, out of that comes a big idea, and then it gets executed across all the different channels and platforms. What's interesting about this is that's actually not how it really works. What happens in reality is we have the brief, out of that the traditional agency gives us this big TV idea, and then you have cute TV extensions, print extensions, radio extensions, digital extensions, and the social stuff which no one has really figured out completely. It's not working anymore. It's, it's not working for the world we live in. And the heart of the problem is digital is not an extension of TV. It's not just another channel, it's fundamentally different. The model of the future, I feel, is going to be something like this. You start with strong consumer insights, you have the brief, then you have the ideas that can come from any kind of agency, and I think this was also touched upon, whether we call them the traditionals or whatever it may be. We want ideas to come from any agency, and then separate to that, execution happens based on channel skill set. Because the best ideas are the ones that don't necessarily start in TV. They can come from any agency, and we have to allow for that. And in fact, even in some cases, from the media companies too. Uh, Sobe is one of our brands where we've experimented with this model. It's actually been very successful. We had a digital agency end up creating a TV ad for us as a result. I'm not saying that applies everywhere to every uh, brand and every situation, but it leads to interesting new possibilities. Um, so that comes to the last idea, idea five. So I'm going to talk a little bit about measurement, and I hope you're going to stay awake for this, because I know measurement can get a little boring, and it's been a long day, and you've been extremely patient, certainly with me. So please, just a little longer to stay awake uh, in, in this room, at least with me. So, I fundamentally believe that our traditional brand metrics aren't enough anymore. And it's built on this very basic core premise that the way people talk about a brand is much more important and is going to be the most important brand metric in the future, period. It's as simple as that. The question is, how do we know how people are talking about our brands? Ten years ago, we had no clue. We would do our surveys, we'd do our focus groups, but it would never give us a real pulse. Today, thanks to the volume and the scale of conversations happening online, we can actually get to that point. So with that, I'd like to share with you the SIM score metric. It's a, it's a brand health metric. It, it actually, you know, it's, it's grandparent, you could say, is the net promoter score, but this is on the brand health side. And the uh, formula is fairly straightforward. It looks at your online conversation market share, adjusts it for sentiment and influence, and gives you an index benchmark relative to your competitors. It's no use you know, me learning that my brands have 65% conversation market share if it's all not negative. Well, it's no use me knowing that um, 99% of the conversations about Mountain Dew are positive if there are only five people talking about it. Um, so this combines those two factors into one metric. Where it gets very interesting is when you look at it across time as different marketing activities are executed upon. So this is a, a Pepsi, uh, I forget the name of that other company, uh, comparison. Uh, and we learn a lot by looking at this. Another example is, this is actually looking at uh, the auto space, looking at uh, Mercedes-Benz. Um, so they're in the blue, and you can see their SIM score changing based on different marketing events or marketplace activities. So it's fascinating to see 
when you launch a campaign, what effect it has on the marketplace. When you bring a new product in, when you sponsor an event, when you run a campaign, uh, when a competitor has a PR crisis, how it changes how consumers are talking about you, and whether that hurts your online brand health over a long period of time. Um, and that's the power of a SIMP score. Um, we launched this, or I launched this last fall. We're now in the process of updating the formula, um, accounting for some of these factors. This is where, if you want to fall asleep, it's by reading this slide. Um, but where this gets very interesting and something that we're discovering is the SIM score, the way people talk about your brand online, through that comparative metric, is starting to serve for some industries, some product categories, as a leading indicator of sales. Now, that's crazy. You know, we'd have never thought to assume that. But for high consideration purchases uh, and those product categories, we're absolutely starting to see the, it serve as a leading indicator with those trend lines. So what are the key implications? How people talk about your brand is everything in the future. You have to pay attention to that. The SIM score is one critical metric that can help with it. Uh, we are optimizing it based on correlating those numbers. Um, and uh, email me or tweet me ideas or suggestions or thoughts around it. So just a recap of the five ideas I had for you. One is through social, you can create a whole digital franchise as we're doing with Pepsi uh, Refresh Project. Go to refresheverything.com to get a feel of it. The second is display media can be reinvented with social media, and I think it needs that reinvention. Third, it's time to turn brand marketing upside down with social voices. Fourth, I'd humbly suggest that the agency model of yesterday is not working, and we need to look at that more strategically and give digital its seat at the table, as well as PR, as well as social. Um, and it's time also to look at new metrics like the SIM score. Thank you very much.